Good evening, everyone. Kyle with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits here. Welcome to our tasting of Sauvignon Blanc, a tasting I wanted to do last summer, but we just kind of ran out of time. Now, when I say Sauvignon Blanc, you're all going to immediately think New Zealand, and I promise you we are going to get there. Um, fun little story, when I initially set this up, uh, I actually had the Astrolab as the natural second wine we do right after the French, so we could talk about the two most you know, important historical and best-selling regions for Sauvignon Blanc in the world. And then I tasted it and was like, well, the TR has to go ahead of it. And then I tasted the Voyager. It's like, well, that has to go ahead of it. We're going to talk about why that is. We're going to talk about why the New Zealand wines are so incredibly expressive and bright and flavorful. But we'll get to that. Sauvignon Blanc is not originally a New Zealand grape. It's originally a French grape, and it comes from all over different parts of France. So we are going to start with our French wine tonight. Uh, this is the Domaine de Hautebourg Sauvignon Blanc, and this is from the Loire Valley. Now, before we get to maps, we're just going to talk a little bit about generalities about what Sauvignon Blanc tastes like and what goes into it. So Sauvignon Blanc is a white grape. It has white juice. It has green skins. Um, it tends to be a very, very high acid grape variety. As a result, it tends to, but isn't universally restricted to, uh, parts of the world where we get at least cold evenings, if not chilly days in the fall. This is not something that is traditionally grown in, say, the central plateau of Spain, where it's very, very hot. Um, it tends to be restricted to colder climates, northern France, Canada does a good job of it. Northern Italy can, as long as the altitude is quite high. Slovenia does a good job of it. We'll get to that. Uh, as does the Marlborough region of uh, New Zealand, because it's close to the Antarctic. Now, there are other places in the world that do a decent job of it. We'll talk a little bit about the United States. Much as I hate American Sauv Blanc, we do need to talk about it. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about Chile and a couple other wines from around the world. But broadly, it's a bright, fresh, lean, acidic, clean grape variety. Your big flavors here are grapefruit, lime, green bell pepper, gooseberry, grass, hay. Um, it can have a real mineral or wet stones characteristic to it, particularly out of France and Italy. Um, and this is, while not the same level as, say, Riesling or Chenin Blanc uh, in terms of uh, being a mirror grape variety, where it tastes like the soil that it's grown on, it certainly has a little bit of that going on, like any high acid white tends to. So let's taste the wine in our glass, and then we'll jump straight into maps and talk a little bit about Sauvignon Blanc, its history, and France. Now for me on the nose with this one, I immediately get bright, fresh lime, uh, and real lime, not the, not the little green squeezy bottle in your fridge, which tastes like lime, but doesn't smell like a whole hell of a lot. But I get lime, I get grapefruit, I don't really get a lot of green bell pepper on this one. I'll get that sharp capsicum note. I do get a little bit of grass. I do get a little bit of honey. But this is broadly a fairly generous, fairly soft one. I don't get any of the big complexity I would get from some of the more famous French wine regions that make Sauvignon Blanc. Mostly because this is one that costs $18.95 on the shelf. It's not desperately expensive. This is, for better or worse, our house Sauvignon Blanc, uh, actually for the whole store, because it tastes very appropriate. It tastes very French. It's excellent wine, um, but it's not expensive, and I like that about it. So, Aaron, I see you have our map of France queued up here. Do you want to jump us over to the super maps? I can't see where my mouse is yet. Let go, let go, let go. Did you find it? I got it. 
Uh, do you want to zoom us in just a tad there, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Nice. Okay, so here is France. So we're going to focus really on northern France here. Uh, we're going to kind of ignore the south. That's not to say there isn't Sauvignon Blanc down here, uh, particularly down here in um, what you can kind of see here as being orange. Uh, this is Languedoc Roussillon down here. That's not where you're going to find a lot of high quality Sauvignon Blanc, uh, but it is a place where you're going to find a lot of it grown to fill things like, um, say, Fat Bastard Sauvignon Blanc or Le Jamel or a lot of your kind of 10 to $15 French Sauvignon Blancs do tend to come from the south, not because it's a great part of the world for growing Sauvignon Blanc, but that tends to be where a lot of the inexpensive Sauvignon Blanc is grown. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of Sauvignon Blanc in Bordeaux, uh, where I'm kind of circling here with my pointer. This would be roughly where Grave is on the left bank of Bordeaux. Here it's going to be blended with Sauvignon Blanc, uh, probably blended with Semillon. It is Sauvignon Blanc. It's not blended with itself. Um, so it's grown here, uh, and there's also a great deal of it here in this central uh, area between the two rivers, uh, which is called Anse de Mer. There is quite a lot of it there. Uh, there is a little bit north here, Aaron, if you'd be so kind. Uh, just uh, roll your mouse pointer. There you go. Oh, there we go. Um, there is a little tiny bit of it um, in Burgundy. Now, not here. Now, when we talk about Burgundy, we're predominantly talking about Chardonnay, and we're talking about white grapes. And if we're not talking about Chardonnay, uh, we're talking about Aligote Blanc. Um, but up here, this is Chablis right here, which is kind of where the super light, super fresh, acidic, cold climate, unoaked Chardonnays come from. But this little pink blob right here, that's the village of St. Brie. Uh, and that's actually Sauvignon Blanc. It's the only place in Burgundy that actually grows Sauvignon Blanc. But all of that set aside, what we're really talking about with Sauvignon Blanc, we're talking about the Loire Valley right here. Now, I believe we actually have a separate map for the Loire Valley, Aaron, if you'd be so kind. I will allow you. There we are. There you go. We'll click in. Uh, so this is the Loire Valley. Uh, this is the Nantes, which opens out onto the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and it kind of follows the Loire River all the way up uh, until we get into what we call the upper or central Loire. Uh, and this is the heart of Sauvignon Blanc country right here. Uh, here is Sancerre and Puy Fumé stare at each other across the river, uh, and then slightly to the north is the Cote de Guinoa. Um, this is really the heart of Sauvignon Blanc country in France. And indeed, our, uh, our Domaine de Haute-Bourg uh, does come from the Loire Valley in general. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a great deal of Sauvignon Blanc all through the valley. Um, Domaine de Haute-Bourg uh, is actually a predominantly a Muscadet house and is based in the Nantes. So the wine is actually probably made down here at the river, although most of the grapes down here are going to be Melon, or to use the old term Melon de Bourgogne, uh, which is used to make uh, the wines of Muscadet. Uh, here on the south bank in Anjou and Saumur and Chinon, this is predominantly Cabernet Franc country, uh, which is kind of interesting because one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, the relation to of Sauvignon Blanc to other grape varieties on earth. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is related very closely to Chenin Blanc. Uh, it's probably a first cousin of that. It is the parent grape of Cabernet Sauvignon, which you know, you'd initially think, oh, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense other than the name, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon. It takes the Sauvignon from Sauvignon Blanc and the Cabernet from Cabernet Franc and kind of blends them together for the name. But when you realize that all through this part of the world, along with Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc's first cousin, uh, it's mostly planted with Sauvignon Blanc on the north bank of the river uh, and with Cabernet Franc on the south. So at some point in the 18th century, uh, a bee kind of cross-pollinated a Cabernet Franc vine and a Sauvignon Blanc vine and created uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So there is Sauvignon Blanc planted through here. There is a little tiny bit in the Nantes, uh, but most of it is over here in the east of the valley with Sancerre and Puy Fumé. So that's where Sauvignon Blanc is really from. That's, that's kind of the end of Supermaps here, uh, at least for the minute. We'll jump back to that in a little while. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about you know, wines you might find. So we have tasted Chateau Ferron on the channel before. That is your classic Bordeaux white. Um, Bordeaux, uniquely uh, among the French whites, uh, blends Sauvignon Blanc with some Semillon. Uh, we'll talk about that when it comes to be important with the Voyager. Uh, here's an example of a St. Brie, which is that little tiny comedy in Burgundy. Uh, and finally, we do have a Sancerre, which is the classic region along with Puy Fumé and the Cote de Guinois uh, in the extreme east of the Loire Valley. 
So that's where this comes from. Um, and Sauvignon Blanc has been quietly increasing in value and popularity and um, commercial viability within France. Um, this is a fun statistic I pulled up. In 1968, Sauvignon Blanc was the 13th most planted grape variety in France. And that's insane to me. Um, you know, Chardonnay was going to be number one because it's planted kind of throughout. Uh, and Uni Blanc is really widely planted. You also know it as Trebbiano. Um, it's widely planted out throughout France um, to, yes, make bulk wines, but it's also kind of the core of the, the distillation industry for making things like cognac and Armagnac and brandy. There's a lot of Uni Blanc in France. Um, but after that, I mean, there's Chenin in France, and there's Riesling in France, and there's Sauvignon in France. But when we get down to the point where it's like 13th most planted, what the heck else is ahead of it that it's 13th in 1968? Uh, it's now the third most, most planted grape uh, after Chardonnay, which is used for making wine, uh, and Uni Blanc, which is planted in absolutely massive quantities, purely for Carmignac, Armagnac, uh, and Brandy. There is a little bit of wine made with it, but it's like 1% or 2% of the total crop, so we're not really going to talk about that too much. Uh, so, where are we going to run through here? Um, geographers are fainting with happiness right now. Uh, well, you'll be fainting with wine very soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a very bright, fresh, cheerful springtime kind of wine. This is exactly what I would want to be drinking in this sort of weather where, you know, it's warm during the day and I, I get a bit of a thirst and then it gets a little cooler in the evening so that that higher acidity is very fresh and very bright and very welcoming. You know, I have to forgive me with my notes. As I said, I had the Astrolab second because if we're telling it as a story, New Zealand does kind of have to come next. Um, but we're actually going to move on to the Tiare here from Friuli. That's going to be our second wine this evening. Uh, the Tiare here is from Collio in the extreme northeast of Italy. So we are way up northeast of Venice. We're actually closer to Trieste than we are to Venice. Uh, and we're right in the Slovenian Alps. So we are now the Slovenian Alps are not as tall as, say, the Italian or Austrian Alps. They're more like big foothills here um, but it is actually a really important wine in uh, wine region for Italy because of how important Sauvignon Blanc has become as an international grape. Now I did talk about it being the third most important grape or third most planted grape in France in terms of white grapes um, after Chardonnay and Uni Blanc but as a in terms of sales um, the most recent statistic I saw was from 2017 that had Sauvignon Blanc still ahead of Pinot Grigio by a hair. Uh, but I have to think that in those last four years, Sauvignon Blanc has to have been passed by Pinot Grigio just because of how much Pinot Grigio we're selling right now. So I would guess that internationally, it's either second or more likely third globally in terms of sales. And as a result, just like Chardonnay, it's grown all around the world. Now, there are lots of places that are brand new wine regions like China or uh, Uruguay, or uh, there's actually a huge uh, program of planting South African, uh, pardon me, South African Sauvignon Blanc uh, happening right now. There's a lot of growth with Sauvignon Blanc even still, even if the big boom time of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, which again, if the wines had cooperated, we'd have already talked about, um, but it's still planted all around the world. It's a major international grape. But there are some other historical places other than France, in the old world, where it's always been traditional to grow it. So we're going to jump over to Supermaps here for a second, if I may. I'm fighting Aaron for the mouse here, so uh, it's going really well. There you go. All right, so we are going to scroll up here, and we are going to jump out of southern Italy. Uh, we're going to get right up here to the north. Would you let me zoom in here for a second, Aaron? Yep. Awesome. So here we are. Uh, so here's Venice itself. Uh, down here is the city of, or village, village city, something of Trieste. Um, and here's the country of Slovenia. Um, you'll notice on the map here it says uh, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. Um, most of what they're talking about is over here, and that's all going to be your Pinot Grigio, your Merlot, uh, your Chardonnay, your Cabernet Franc, and your Frosco. Um, interestingly, this doesn't mention Sauvignon Blanc in this wine guide, which I think is very interesting. But there is a ton of Sauvignon Blanc planted right here, right along this little tiny strip of land right against the Slovenian Alps, uh, which is the region of Collio. And this is where this wine comes from. And it's becoming one of the most important Sauvignon Blanc 
regions in terms of quality, uh, if not in terms of volume. Uh, now, I do want to draw attention to the name Friulano here. Um, that's actually a local variant or mutant or cousin of Sauvignon Blanc. I think it's probably best stated as a, a mutant of Sauvignon Blanc. It's also called Sauvignon Az or Sauvignon Vert. Uh, it's a very close cousin, uh, and it's actually the local grape Friulano. Uh, so you'll uh, still occasionally see wines named Friulano, and I, I don't know if uh, Friuli is named for the grape Friulano or Friulano is named for the region Friuli. Couldn't really find a good answer for that, but it is a very, very important grape here. Uh, but along with the, the cousin, the Sauvignon As or Sauvignon Vert, there is also Sauvignon Blanc planted here. Now, this wine did win. Uh, I think we can be done with maps for just a minute there. Uh, this did win uh, the special trophy uh, at uh, the Mondial in 2014. Um, you'll notice on the neck tag it says Bordeaux. Uh, it's not actually, the show is not in Bordeaux. The show is actually in Brussels. Uh, this won the Bordeaux White Special Trophy. Um, Mondial is not one of the major, major wine shows, but it's a really fun one. Mondial is really interesting because they'll, they'll present like emerging regions. Um, kind of like Hungarian Kek Francos is all the rage right now in terms of wine for us. Um, but it was kind of tearing up in Mondial in like 2013, 2014, 2015. It's kind of a good indicator of what's going to be big in time. Uh, and yes, they do you know, award you know, specific trophies for this is the best oaky Californian Chardonnay in the world. But they, more interestingly, they, they do these um, special trophies. So you can enter your Italian Sauvignon Blanc in the Bordeaux white category if you want to. I mean, you're mad to, you're probably going to lose. But if, you know, a panel of like, you know, well-seasoned, well-thought-through wine judges sit down and taste your Italian Sauvignon Blanc, that can actually win best Bordeaux white in the world. It's a very interesting wine competition, and it really does let apples be apples to a certain point. Um, we just started bringing in this Romanian Pinot Noir, um, which is like fifteen ninety five or fourteen ninety five. It's absolute madness cheap. Um, probably the best under twenty Pinot Noir in the store. And we are actually going to do because of that wine, uh, best under twenty dollar Pinot Noir in the store, uh, which is not a tasting that I even three years ago would have thought I'd ever want to do because under twenty Pinot is usually dreadful. Um, but that's the sort of wine that would do very well at this competition. It's not about, you know, just praising the establishment. Oh, look, Shadow Mouton Rothschild won Best Bordeaux again for the 50th year in the row. Well, well done for them. Um, this is about new, emerging, interesting regions that are doing very, very high quality things. And that's why this actually won uh, Best Sauvignon Blanc in the world, which is crazy for an Italian Sauvignon Blanc. Should you be suspicious of the trophy advertising? Absolutely. Anytime a wine puts a badge on the label, including this one, you should immediately discount it completely and think it's worth absolutely nothing. It's worth the exact same as them calling it, you know, TRA super duper extra fantastic Collio Sauvignon Blanc. They are meaningless. I just find the Mondial de Bruxelles really interesting and different because it's a really cool wine show. I did want to touch on it just because it's a slightly different wine show than most of the ones in the world because it encourages a little more experimentation. It encourages a little bit more new thinking, which I, I really like. They, more than any other wine show, have these special medals. And if you go to their website and you like look at the, uh, the wine awards, they don't lead with you know best Bordeaux, best Chardonnay, best anything. They lead with like their innovator awards, which I think is really a, an interesting approach. Now, flavor-wise, aroma-wise, this kind of takes everything this had. It takes the lime, that's there. It takes the grapefruit, that's certainly there. I would say this adds a little bit more of that tropical gooseberry sort of thing that we would normally associate with New Zealand, and it kind of splashes that in as well. But the big thing I think that the, uh, the tiare adds for the 5 or $6 upcharge over the, the French it adds herbs, it adds marjoram, and it adds basil, and it adds like a, almost like a bitter celery thing going on. I really like that about Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, Sauvignon Blanc, assuming it's well-made, i.e. not American. Um, actually, I don't even have an American Sauvignon Blanc 
on the table. I don't have one in the store. I actually went so far, because there is an American Sauvignon Blanc that we do have to talk about briefly, which is called Fumé Blanc. Um, I actually went through the opinion boxes to try and find a bottle, not to open, it's someone else's wine that they prepaid for, but just to display and talk about it. Um, I hate American Sauvignon Blanc so much that I don't even have a bottle of it in the store full stop. Um, but we will talk about that uh, probably when we get to the Voyager. Uh, the kind of other places around the world that have attempted it uh, and done that with mixed success. So it's got the herbs, it's got the a little bit of tropical fruit, but not a whole lot. It's got the grapefruit, it's got the lime, it's got the grass, it's got the hay, but it's just got a little bit more of everything. Uh, if you want to see why I'm you know, saying, oh, well, this is so much more, because these are very similar wines, try going back. Try going back to the Domaine Aubourg. Uh, I did this before we went on camera. It kind of disappears after the Tiare, just because the Tiare is offering just 10, 15% more of everything. It's just a little more rich. This will still taste like baby's first Sauvignon Blanc, like Jackson Triggs or Copper Moon Sauvignon Blanc. It'll still taste vaguely like Sauvignon Blanc, but all the delicacy and interest we got on this will disappear, and that's why we do taste wines in a certain order, no matter how much it destroys the story we're trying to tell. And yeah, Devin and I, uh, like we said when we were doing the um, the tasting for the uh, Johanna Zillinger wines, um, sometimes we get surprised. Something comes out of nowhere. Until we tasted this wine, we'd never heard of Colio. Uh, we carry a few wines now from Colio. This is actually uh, the Friulano, the, the local variant of Sauvignon Blanc uh, by a winery called Russi's uh, from the same region. This actually really did just lead Dev and I down this garden path of super interesting grapes from this Colio region. Um, super underdeveloped. Uh, it was at one point like a real hot point, flashpoint for the Cold War because it was right on the Iron Curtain because uh, we're so close to Trieste, which you know Winston Churchill so famously he said was like the southern extent of the Iron Curtain in his Iron Curtain speech. Like this was not a part of the world. Like. Everybody expected that, you know, why put money here? Because in 10 years, the communists could just come across the border and claim it. Or, you know, on the other side, the capitalist pigs will come across the border and claim it. Um, it became this real, like, no man's land of nobody wanted to develop it because it was so unstable. And it's only now, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we're starting to see real development into Kali, and we're starting to see what has been historically a locally famous, if not internationally famous, region start to really strut its stuff and show its full colors. I really like it for that. And yeah, you're right, Kevin. Like, this really does just utterly vanish. And it's a great wine. For under 20, this is... I'll actually just say this is the best under 20 Sauvignon Blanc in the store, period. And we have some good ones in New Zealand. Um, but yeah, this just kind of vanishes. And that's just the reason we taste them in this order. And yeah, that tastes like really cheap $8 Sauvignon Blanc that you taste at a wedding, and it sucks. Anyway, um, we tasted that fresh, and it was great, so let's move on. I'm not going to bad talk that one because I actually really like it. Let's move on to Voyager Estate. Uh, this is a wine that is a Sauvignon Blanc Semillon blend. Um, now, if you weren't here for our Bordeaux tasting, Semillon in Bordeaux is blended in in varying quantities. You can have wines that are 95% Sauvignon Blanc, 5% Semillon. You can have particularly dessert wines that are 95% Semillon, 5% Sauvignon Blanc in Bordeaux. They're both treated as incredibly important components of the blend. The Sauvignon Blanc contributing brightness and freshness and acidity. The Semillon does have its own acidity, but in this case is being relied on more to provide honeyed characteristics, long-term aging potential, richness, weight, body, a certain like, uh, as much as I don't like honey brown beers, a certain like honeyed viscous oiliness that in a white wine I actually quite enjoy. So let's jump into Voyager. Uh, now for us here in Lethbridge, uh, we actually started selling Australian Sauvignon Blanc in quantity before New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, uh, and that's entirely our store. That's not a market trend. That's nothing like that. Um, one of the very first things that we started doing just a few years after I got here, and I think I, 
I was part of the crew who actually started doing this. Uh, 2004 was the very, very first time we ever did our Wines of the Year, which we've done religiously every year since. Um, and our very first ever Wine of the Year uh, was January 1st, 2005. Our 2004 Wines of the Year was the preceding year. We named an Australian Sauvignon Blanc made by the Hardy's group called Starve Dog Lane from the Adelaide Hills of Australia, uh, which tasted exactly like New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc was going to taste like in two years. We freaking called it. Um, that was our very first ever wine of the year. Now, New Zealand came along and ate Starve Dog Lane's lunch because New Zealand just became that category. But Australia really does, in colder climate regions, really have the ability to make spectacular Sauvignon Blanc when they want to. But just like, you know, southern France, most of Australia is just too hot to do Sauvignon Blanc justice. You can't do it in the quality and richness and delicacy that you need because it's just too hot. You don't get those cold, cold nights to drive up the acidity in the grapes to make the wine more delicate, to make it fresh, to make it snappy, which is what Sauvignon Blanc needs. Are there Sauvignon Blancs that don't have that racy, snappy acidity? Sure. Um, this is by Dagenau. This is the Le Fille Puy Fumé. It's made entirely from nobly rotted, but still rotted grapes uh, made that you would usually use for making like a dessert wine. Um, but they use this entirely to make a bone dry white wine that's almost antithetical to what we usually think of when we think about like New Zealand Sauve Blanc or just fresh Sauve Blanc in general. It's weighty and it's rich and it's thick and it's oily. It's brilliant. It also happens to be like $80, $90. Um, but it's really different. You don't have to make Sauvignon Blanc according to this, you know, New Zealand paint by numbers. This is how you make Sauvignon Blanc method. And we'll get a little bit to why that is. Uh, again, supposed to be earlier in the talk, but the wine said it couldn't be. Uh, now, Voyager is made by a woman named Alexandra Burt. Uh, she's actually the daughter of the founder of the estate uh, who started the winery in 1978. Now, this is Western Australia, which is completely different soil-wise, philosophy-wise, everything from Eastern Australia. Eastern Australia, or Southeast Australia more commonly, these are regions like Barossa, McLaren Vale, Coonawarra, Langhorn Creek. These are where most of the Australian wines you've ever had have ever come from. These are generally grown on loamy, silty soils. Uh, they tend to be very bright, very fruity. They don't have a distinct smoky note. Uh, if anything, their stylistic you know, top note tends to be eucalyptus or mint. Western Australia, these are grown on old lava fields. They're grown on granite uh, and pumice. And their dominant uh, kind of terroir note tends to be kind of smoky and rich. And if this sounds a lot like, uh, say, Chile or it sounds like South Africa, you're right. That's because it has a lot in common with those regions soil-wise, even though it's on the other side of the globe, at least from Chile. Now, here we are blending in the Semillon, which is adding that kind of honeyed lemon note. Lemon from Sauvignon Blanc shouldn't really be there. It tends to be more lime grapefruit. If you're getting lemon off a of Sauvignon Blanc, a straight Sauvignon Blanc, it's probably been grown too warm or it's been from very young vines. You should get that snappier, tighter, more aggressive citrus note than just like lemon. But Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc together, you should get kind of like bright, fresh, almost cooked lemon. And I definitely get that here. I do get the honey notes. I get a little bit of the smoke. I get beeswax. It's a very different experience once you blend in some Semillon. But it's so historically important that we really couldn't do a Sauvignon Blanc tasting without including a Semillon that had uh, been blended in with the blend. You need that variety just because this is such a big part of the Sauvignon Blanc story. This is where Bordeaux Blanc and where Sauternes comes from is blending in that Semillon. Uh, and this is done in Canada. We have Canadian Semsov. We've had American, against my better judgment. We've had quite a few Australians. Although the Australians, for whatever reason, despite the fact it's actually not a good blend, really like Semillon Chardonnay, 
which I don't understand. I think it came out of the fact that they had a lot of Semyon they didn't know what to do with, and they figured just throwing it on with Chardonnay because people knew what Chardonnay was would sell better. I've had a lot of bad Sem Shard. I think it pairs much better with Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we're not going to get maps for the Voyager Estate. Um, honestly, there's there's Eastern Australia and Western Australia. This is the bit on the western half of the continent. Um, I don't know Margaret River or Western Australia well enough as a region to really dig into the differences and complexities of the region. And I'm also not going to pretend that I do by having a map and saying, oh, well, this tastes like this and this tastes like this. I don't know. Western Australia, as far as Australia is concerned, is a bit of a no man's land, at least for my palate and my experience. So I know broad strokes what Western Australia tastes like, but I'm not going to pretend I know more than I do because I just don't know. It is really and truly something I'm just coming around to. It's also to a point, th there's, there's been some new school winemaking, a little less high alcohol, a little less heavy extraction happening all through Australia. But I think the Western Australia, at least for what we're seeing here, is leading that charge. And we're getting a little lower alcohol, a little cleaner, a little more wild ferment, a little more interesting wines out of Western Australia versus the rest of the country. It's a Big Mac. I don't know how to parse that exactly, but I will say I'd have that for dinner. Um, that's a beautiful wine. Like I'd have that without anything else. Um, let's talk a little bit about food pairing uh, since Jeremy gave me the segue. Sauvignon Blanc is kind of the wine you pair when nothing else will do. Fresh raw tomatoes, asparagus, spinach, hot wings. Um, Foods that really don't pair well, uh, particularly with red wine, or don't pair well with a lot of wines in general, um, they do really, really well with Sauvignon Blanc, just because Sauvignon Blanc can almost stand in for like a cold pint of beer, in the sense they have a lot of acidity, they have a lot of brightness, they have a lot of freshness, but they don't have like a long lingering finish. You're not really hanging out, even with the Voyager, which I think is perhaps, well, certainly the most expensive thing on the table, I don't know if it's necessarily the most interesting. It's really one of those things where you can put it in with pesto or goat cheese, something that's very difficult to otherwise pair, and it will just break up those complex flavors, it will give you a big hit of flavor, and it will work where other wines will not. Uh, and like Devin said, we actually bought this sight unseen. Devin and I tasted the Chardonnay from Voyager Estate uh, and loved the Chardonnay so, so much we had to bring in the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we were definitely not looking for an Australian Sauvignon Blanc Semillon at almost $30. That was basically at the literal bottom of the list if we actually bothered keeping a list. Um, but the Chardonnay was so incredible. We loved it so much we had to bring this in even though we actually never tasted it until we brought it in. And then we brought it in and we're absolutely thrilled with it. So it was wonderful. Yeah, clean, lots of layers, lots of complexity. Real mineral note. You know, I, I will say, if I was going to have a complaint about the uh, the Domaine Oatburg and the Tiare, I didn't get a lot of the the real mineral limestone thing that you can get from really top class Sauvignon Blanc. I get more of it out of the Voyager estate than the others. And I don't know if that's just it being grown on a more readily apparent soil because being grown on lava is really apparent in the wine. Uh, in some cases, I think it's a little too apparent out of Chile. But yeah, I finally get a real terroir note out of this one where I don't think I did out of the first two. I will note that this is also the first one where I really get a, a big green pepper leaning into like hot pepper note. Um, this is a big thing with Sauvignon Blanc. We don't get it so much here. We will definitely get it on the Astrolab. Green peppers after like lime and grapefruit and maybe grass is one of the most dominant flavors in Sauvignon Blanc. Out of Chile, I get a real fruity pepper characteristic like habaneros or scotch bonnets. Um, out of New Zealand, it tends to be like just straight up green bell pepper. This is coming off to me more like the South American style where I get more of those fruity peppers. Um, but it is very much part of the flavor profile of Sauvignon Blanc. But in this one, it's a little more in the background. It was actually just my last sip where I really picked that up.
Okay. We are really ahead of schedule, but that's okay. Let's step away just for a sec. Let's talk about what we got coming up next. Then we'll jump into New Zealand, uh, Sauvignon Blanc around the world, and questions. So, this coming Wednesday, we are going to be doing the Pink Boots Brews. Uh, Pink Boots Brew is an initiative trying to get more women into the brewing industry uh, and trying to encourage more women brewers just in general. Uh, all the proceeds tend to go to charities, uh, specifically women's charities in most cases, uh, and four Alberta breweries each did one. Well, much more than four Alberta breweries actually did one. These were the four that we could get. Uh, three of them are sours. From Snake Lake, we have the Mrs. Dingwall's Red Sangria Sour. Uh, from Annex, we have the non-compliant Blood Orange and, I want to say Cranberry? Yes, I actually got that one. Uh, sour. Uh, from Establishment, we have the Avant Gardener, which is a slightly sour smoked Belgian table beer with rose hips. That's going to be really interesting to dig into. Uh, and then from uh, Blind Men, we have their Full Circle Roggen Beer or Rye Ale. Uh, really fun, different offbeat tasting. Um, just focusing on women brewers. All of these beers were brewed either on or just about International Women's Day. We're just starting to get the beers now. So really, really fun, interesting stuff that we'll have on Wednesday. One week from tonight, uh, we are back to Spirits. Uh, and we just had some new stuff roll in the door. Uh, these are our by Cooper's Choice, an independent bottler we don't talk about a whole lot, mostly because they only do a couple of releases a year. Um, and our theme this time is wacky, crazy barrel finishes. Um, four whiskeys, all four aged in completely different barrels. Uh, so we have a Tullibardine 2011 that's aged in Muscatel or Muscat cask. Uh, we have a Milton Duff out of Imperial Milk Stout cask. Uh, this is the Tomatin, which is out of Portwood, which is called Forest Fruits. That one's really good. Uh, and then finally, we have an Ardmore out of Madeira cask. So four different whiskeys, all at cast strength, all no chill filtration, no caramel addition, none of that all of the four very, very different barrels. We're going to try and get either Chris or Kelly Stewart from Harvest Vintage Imports to join us as a guest. I phoned them both this afternoon. Neither picked up. So uh, we can just put a pin in that and say maybe. Uh, but yeah, that is our whiskey tasting coming up in a week. Tickets are $30 for that. That will get you four one-ounce little mini bottles uh, of the tasting, plus the talk, and, you know, the usual stuff. They you rule. folks know how it goes. Very yummy. Okay, so we are not quite 38 minutes in, apparently on line four. So we've, we've made good time. So let's talk about New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and I don't give a big sigh because I'm really tired of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. I'm not. I'm giving a big sigh because it's a big topic and there's a lot to talk about. And I thought I was going to get to do this two wines ago. Um, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. So... Let's set the table a little bit here. Like I said, 1968, it was the 13th most planted grape in France. So what happened between 1968 and, say, um, 1984 when Cloudy Bay got going? Well, a few things. Sauvignon Blanc got exported around the world. Um, it ended up in a few places. It ended up in Chile, where I really do believe they can make great Sauvignon Blanc. We just haven't seen it yet. The problem is, is that Chilean wine regardless of what it is, doesn't matter if it's Shiraz, it tends to pick up this hot peppers, green pepper characteristic. And since Sauvignon Blanc already has that characteristic in it as a grape, it tends to come off so aggressively peppery um, and not like black pepper, like green peppers. It's off-putting, uh, not only to like most people or to customers, but also to me. Um, I actually had to walk around. I was like, oh, I should talk about Chile and Sauvignon Blanc. I should just get one off the shelf. Yeah, we don't have one. I don't like them. Uh, so I don't even have one in the shop. Uh, the other place it ended up, and this is somewhere where it actually achieved pretty big commercial success, and this is the reason we have this bottle of Rombauer Chardonnay on the table. Um, after Sauvignon Blanc left France, it ended up in California where they started making Fumé Blanc out of it. Now, if you haven't had Fumé Blanc, you're probably under 35 because this was something that was a really, really big deal. So 
in the early 80s through early to mid 90s, Californian Chardonnay just ran the world. That was the wine that the world wanted and they literally couldn't get enough of it. But of course, barrel aged Chardonnay requires barrels. And when the barrels start running out of flavor, because California Chardonnay requires a lot of bar barrel characteristic, particularly in this uh, time period, you have to do something with those old barrels. So there was a lot of Sauvignon Blanc planted in California at this time. And they were kind of looking around like, what the heck do we do? They looked at Pui Fume, who just by a freak of soil types has kind of a smoky characteristic. And they said, okay, well, what if we take these old Chardonnay barrels and we just toast the ever loving hell out of them just over a big gas jet and we burn the inside of the barrel so it's super charred and super smoky. And then we age the Sauvignon Blanc in that. So not only does it pick up kind of that barrel aged character, but also picks up a smoky character like Pui Fume. Uh, and so was born Fume Blanc. And while it's almost extinct, at least in Canada now, although it carries on with decent sales in the US, this was a huge deal. Um, long before New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, way before we started selling like major quantities of like French or Italian or Australian Sauvignon Blanc, Fumé Blanc was a big deal. It was the very first explosion of Sauvignon Blanc way before New Zealand. Uh, and it was this completely different style. It was oak aged and smoky and charred and different. And I've had examples I've liked but it's a real like mind fuck of a style like it's it's really different than any other Sauvignon Blanc I've tried selling them in the store off and on they never do very well just because it's kind of uh, a historical artifact it's interesting to talk about and I wish I had one to pour for you and talk about tonight but it's not something that I would ever buy for myself or sell to you if you came in like I want the best Sauvignon Blanc in the store for me Blanc would be like not top of mind at all they're very very different so after Chile, after California's big explosion of Fumé Blanc, uh, after we kind of set some sales records selling Starve Dog Lane Sauvignon Blanc at Australia, um, the New Zealand guys, the, the Kiwis, they were doing their own thing. Uh, in 1984, a gentleman named Kevin Judd became the head winemaker at Cloudy Bay, uh, a wine we still carry to this day, although Kevin Judd's no longer the winemaker. Um, this wine is, without any exaggeration, the wine that literally invented New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc today. Why aren't we tasting it part of, as part of tonight's tasting? Because it's $36 and absolutely not worth that much money. Uh, I also have Kim Crawford out here. Also, equally spectacularly at like $18.95, not worth the money. Um, instead, we're going to do Astrolab. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about where New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc comes from, why it tastes the way it tastes, and why it's so important. So Kevin Judd arrives in at Cloudy Bay, or I, I think he was actually, he's natively Kiwi. I can't say, you know, he was native, he arrived in New Zealand. He was always in New Zealand. But he arrives at Cloudy Bay. He starts making this Sauvignon Blanc style. Now, in 1984, you know, Fumé Blanc was kind of getting going in California. But even at that point, it was a little bit counterculture. It was a little bit new. You know, nothing like Voyager Estate existed. Something like TRA, it would have been drank locally, but it didn't exist. What did he have to reference from? Well, he had the Loire Valley and, I guess, Bordeaux. And that was literally it. It wasn't like the wine market now where I have, you know, Sauvignon Blancs from basically every part of the Loire and one from Bordeaux and I have a St. Brie and I have stuff from Terrain and I have all sorts of madness. Back then, it's like, okay, I'm a young winemaker. I'm in New Zealand. I've got a whole bunch of Sauv Blanc I don't know what to do with. What am I going to do with it? Well, he basically took Pui Fumé and Sancerre and just threw them in the bin and said, screw it, I'm doing my own thing. And he created New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc basically by himself. So what is New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? Why is it so different? It's because it's so damn loud. If these had grapefruit you had to look for, um, you don't have to look for the grapefruit here. It's right on top. You don't have to look for the lime. It's right on top. You don't have to look for the green pepper. It's screaming at you. It's all right in your face. It's everything we've taken through these dialed up to 11, super loud, super fresh, more acidity, more everything. It's just a giant of a wine 
without oak aging, without malolactic fermentation, without you know skin contact like an orange wine or a red wine. This is just taking all of the the little cheats we use to make everything else, including you know chardonnays and and red wines and orange wines and everything else, and just saying no, I'm just going to make a really really loud wine without any of those other winemaking tricks. And that's what New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is. And that's why it's kind of brilliant, even if it's a little bit overdone right now, thanks to Tim Crawford and Oyster Bay and Mount Riley and Stonely and so many others. And Jeremy nails it. It is oily. Um, it has it has some oiliness, but the, the fruit character just translates. It just it shifts gears from first to second right into the mouth. What you get on the nose is exactly what you expect in the mouth. This had honeycomb and beeswax, and this had kind of pretty hay and other things. Um, this had a little bit of a, a wool, lamb's wool sort of thing. This, nope, it's just fruit and peppers, like right in your face, all you can handle, all you want, and a little bit more. Big, 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 loud, loud, loud. And I picked this a little bit on purpose. I could have done Stanley here. I could have done Babbage or... Uh, Kim Crawford or any of the other you know big names. I chose Astrolab because I actually like this. I think of our under 20 New Zealand Sauv Blancs, it's probably my favorite of them. But this wine still speaks to me. The alcohol is a little lower at 13.5. It's pretty, it's bright, it's got a lot of grass, it's got a lot of grapefruit. Yeah, and you know what? I chose Astrolab because I like it. I think that Kim Crawford would have probably gotten smoked by the earlier lineup. I chose the Astrolab because it still speaks to the other wines. There is definitely a bad New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc movement, and I'll return to that in a minute, um, because it's actually getting better as sales fall. But, yeah, I mean, the Astrolab is great. It's exactly what you'd want from a New Zealand Sauv Blanc. But it still references back to these other wines where I would say something like Kim Crawford or Stonely or Matua. Maybe don't. They're riffing off of Cloudy Bay. That's their, that's their origin story. Their, their origin story begins in 1984. I think with Astrolab, their origin story starts a little more in France, and that's why I like them. Uh, let's jump over to Supermaster one last time here. I clicked, yeah, because you told me to click. Just started a program that I haven't opened in years. Oh, before. well, that's fine. <laughs> this is Aaron who's always telling me, oh, click to start the map. I, I click and, oh, else. look, okay, I started her. Netscape Navigator. <laughs> there we go. Can you zoom me out just for a second there, Aaron? Yeah, zoom out. There you there go. There we go. Okay, so here is New Zealand. Where we're talking about Sauvignon Blanc, we tend to be talking about the northern tip of the southern island. Uh, this is Marlborough. Now, it's not the only region in uh, New Zealand by any means. Um, you've got Martinborough, which is right up here, which also makes actually pretty killer Sauvignon Blancs. Um, you've got Waipara, which is actually spelled Wairapa, uh, which I find uh, kind of annoying, really. Um, sorry, that's not, that's not Waipara on this map, is it? Sorry, no, that's Hawks Bay. I was going to say, that's not where Wairapa is. No, that's where Waipara is. That makes no sense. Um, sorry, I got my, my regions crossed there for just a second. Um, but yeah, um, Marlboro is its own little thing. It's, it's, it's a fun, unique part of the world where everything kind of tastes grapefruity and bright and fresh. It's, it's an interesting, interesting region. Uh, apparently, Martinborough and Waipara, Waipara are the same thing, but... Um, Martinborough is a subregion of same. Uh, but yes, it's this is kind of the heart of Sauvignon Blanc country. Hawke's Bay is more red, including the Gimlet Gravels, which are kind of their own subregion of same. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, we talk a little bit about Nelson as being the new Marlborough. There's a lot of Sauvignon Blanc coming out of Nelson uh, that is like Marlborough, but I think a lot of speculative plantings were kind of planted here with the idea that Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc is the most popular white wine in the world, and it always will be. Let's just plant all the Sauvignon Blanc here. Uh, that didn't really work out for them. Um, there's a lot of Nelson Sauvignon Blanc that's really not being used for a whole lot. Um, and again, Marlborough is not very big. I mean, Z we're zoomed in pretty heavily here, but I mean, New Zealand's not the biggest country in the world. This is a very small little finger of land. 
Uh, and Marlboro is like really not particularly like able to be expanded because it's so mountainous. I mean, this this delineation here seems very random, but that's a mountain range, as is this. Uh, there's there's really no way to expand the region. Lord of the Rings set. It is the Lord of the Rings set. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Julie's uh, mom wants to know: Do they still make cat's pee on a gooseberry bush? Um, this came out of that range of like funny named wines of about the the late 2000s, very early 2010s, like Fat Bastard and Old Fart and Cat's Pee on a Gooseberry Bush and Mommy's Time Out. Um, there's a bunch of like really, really badly named wines that came out in about this era. Uh, and I haven't seen it in a while. I know the winery almost certainly still exists. I think that was Brancott Estate that at one point was labeling itself Montana Wines, which is very confusing because Montana is not New Zealand. Um, yeah, no, it was... Um, also, Jeremy, I drink and I know things was Game of Thrones, not Lord of the Rings. Um, get your J.R.R. Tolkien and George R.R. R. Martin separate, sir. Th those oh, are dang, different we things. Have a thing for the, for them, eh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we do have that. All right. We'll the um, the we'll throw the link in the description. God. <laughs> I'm playing it right now. You're just going to play it right now? <laughs> just right on the channel? We'll, we'll save that to the end. We'll make that our outro. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's um, New Zealand Sauv Blanc. It's just everything but louder. Uh, was it a Sauvignon Blanc? Yes, it was. It was a Sauvignon Blanc. Right. Our new theme, weirdly named wines that are really good. Well, I will be very straight with you. Um, Fat Bastard and Old Fart and Mommy's Time Out were really, really bad. Cats Pee on the Gooseberry Bush we actually kept on the shelf, and I actually thought it was okay. The labeling was awful. As much as you could make a cat urinating on a gooseberry bush a good label, this was somehow worse than the best example you could think of um, by quite a bit. It was bright neon green. The cat was badly drawn. The gooseberry bush, I think, was just like a plant coming out of a litter box. It could have done better. Okay, so what have we talked about with tonight? We've talked a little bit about how chili just tastes like hot peppers. We've talked about the various places in France you can grow Sauvignon Blanc. We've talked about how it's kind of grown internationally, but I think now, post-New Zealand grape explosion, we're starting to see a little bit of a decline in its plantings. It's not being planted in the Central Valley of California or so much in the Central Valley of Chile. It's not being planted ever because New, well, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc sales, but Sauvignon Blanc sales in general as well, have been falling over the last five to five to six years, more so in the last two to three. We're starting to see some new regions that could do a better job of it, like Margaret River, starting to kind of reemerge and reintroduce people into Sauvignon Blanc that doesn't taste like that classic New Zealand style. But I also will say, don't give up on New Zealand. It's still a classic for a reason. If this is still the biggest one on the table, and it's just about tied for the least expensive. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is a classic for a reason. It's good value, big, fresh wine. There is always a place at the table for wines like this. Not with every meal. I'd say this is more of a dinner wine, but it still has a place. Anyway, I think that is enough for one night on Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I will hopefully see you uh, coming up Wednesday for our Pink Boots Brew tasting. Uh, or failing that, I will see you for our Single Malt Scotch tasting coming up a week from today. Uh, for tonight, though, enjoy your Sauvignon Blanc out on your back deck, out in the sun. Uh, it's the exact perfect time to be drinking Sauvignon Blanc on just an evening such as this. And you all have some, which is perfect. So go outside, enjoy this. I'm going to do the same in about... 45 minutes after we tear down all this bloody lighting and equipment. So, with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits, I'm Kyle Baines. This has been another one of our wonderful Friday night wine tasting series. Have a good night. Applause. Our first ever applause. <laughs> <laughs>